Welcome to another one of our biology department video recordings and this one is on the carbon cycle with our little tagline here you are made from stardust which you know if that doesn't inspire you what will I don't know you are stardust after water carbon the element carbon makes up most of our bodies it is about 18% of our body mass it is such a large component because it makes up the backbone of all biological molecules. Due to a particular property it has, it is tetravalent. That means it can make four bonds. Each carbon atom can make four bonds and that means it can make it into great big chains which makes it an extremely useful element. It's also fairly common in the Earth's crust so it's easy ultimately for biological organisms to get hold of it. I say that but the only place that carbon is actually made is at the heart of very large stars and then those carbon atoms well they're no use if they're still in the middle of very large stars no use to biological organisms at any rate and they're only distributed around the universe when those stars go supernova so when that star explodes it distributes carbon atoms well, all around the place really and then some of those are tiny, the tiniest proportion of those carbon atoms have managed to reach us here on Earth and that's how biological organisms get hold of it. So on Earth we now have basically all the carbon we've ever had and all the carbon we will ever have. We're never going to have any more, we never really had any less uh, other than the odd meteorite striking us here and there. As a consequence of that, carbon if it's to be used at all, has to be recycled between living organisms and also between non-living uh, places such as the geosphere, i.e. all the rocks around the place as well. But let's just focus on living organisms. As we know from uh, our studies in photosynthesis, plants take in carbon atoms from the atmosphere and they convert those carbon atoms from being in the form CO2 with each carbon bonded to two oxygen atoms they convert that into biological molecules such as carbohydrates, lipids, proteins and nucleic acids so those carbon atoms which were previously just bonded to oxygen atoms are now bonded to other things, other carbon atoms uh, uh, oxygen atoms, yes, uh, and also hydrogens and sometimes sulfurs and nitrogen atoms Plants also release carbon as carbon dioxide when they themselves respire. Animals, we then eat the plants or eat other animals that have eaten plants and we get our carbon that way and then we release carbon as carbon dioxide in respiration. So if we look at those equations working out, we've got at the top here our equation for photosynthesis. 6CO2 plus 6H2O goes to C6H12O6 plus 6O2 or to put it in non-formulaic terms carbon dioxide plus water is converted into glucose plus oxygen. Now plants then use this glucose here to build themselves. They build themselves from sugar. They turn sugar into wood, into fats, into proteins all sorts of weird and wonderful, well not so weird, but wonderful things such as that. Now then, those carbon compounds, such as this glucose here, is reacted with oxygen and turned back into carbon dioxide and water. And so, these carbon atoms are cycled. They are cycled around. Let's have a look at this image stolen shamelessly from BBC Bite Size. BBC, please don't sue me for shamelessly stealing your image. We have CO2 in the atmosphere here. And the only way CO2 leaves the atmosphere is via this arrow here, this blue arrow representing photosynthesis. The plants take in the CO2 and they use it to make glucose and then build themselves out of the glucose. They then, in turn, will use some of the glucose they have made, some of the glucose they've made, not just to build themselves, but also as fuel for respiration. They need their own energy, and so they will release CO2 that way. 
Um, here is another plant just low down here. What is this plant? It's grass, of course, and grass will do uh, plenty of this uh, photosynthesis, locking up carbon, using its, that to build itself. I flicked on accidentally there. And then this animal will eat that, so will gain carbon atoms in that way, and uh, then this cow, this cow here moo, will do some, forgive me for all the various animal noises, will respire, releasing that carbon as CO2. And this bird over here, well, this bird won't eat the plant, but this bird will eat caterpillars which are eating the plant, this blue tit here. So, this is during the daytime when photosynthesis is going on. Let's have a look at the nighttime, the picture there. Now, at nighttime, there is no photosynthesis. The energy from the sun is not available at this time to the plant, and so the plant and the animals are both doing respiration, are both therefore releasing CO2, and carbon atoms are only going in one direction at night time. They're going from living organisms via respiration into the atmosphere. Well, that is part of the picture, but let's see if we can complete it a little bit more by looking at the uh, idea of decomposition. Now, dead matter is very valuable. There's tons of energy locked up in it, and there are loads of carbon atoms there, which, is, which are really, really useful. And bacteria and fungi use dead organisms as their food source. How do they do that? Well, kind of the same way that we do. Um, they digest the biological molecules of dead organisms using enzymes. They secrete their enzymes uh, out of, directly out of their surface. We secrete our enzymes into our gut. But really, it's the same process. So they digest these large biological molecules that the plant has made or the animal has made. And then they absorb the smaller molecules produced by the digestion. And they'll use them, those smaller molecules, to build up their own bodies or as fuel for respiration themselves. So this way, the carbon atoms that were in the dead animals, the dead plants, are absorbed by the decomposers and used for their own purposes, such as for respiration. And here is a nice picture of a mushroom growing on a log. Now, this mushroom here is only part of a fungus. It is the sex organs of the fungus. The fungus itself will be growing all the way through this dead branch here. And uh, those are just the sex organs exposed uh, there. So let's see if we can complete this by looking at decomposition here. We, you remember we have this blue tit sitting on the branch here? Well, <whistles> bad luck, Mr. Blue Tit, or Mrs. Blue Tit, it's unclear here. Um, this blue tit has died, and uh, it's fallen to the ground, and that is the end of our blue tit, and we, we mourn the blue tit. What will happen now? Well, this blue tit will be consumed by decomposers. It will be, well, eaten really is a word used in reference to animals, and animals such as maggots will certainly eat this blue tit. The decomposers, decomposers we really use to refer to bacteria and fungi, um, microorganisms, and uh, they will digest it, will absorb the carbon atoms, and then will release carbon atoms in photos, in, what am I saying, in respiration, and the carbon dioxide will be released again that way. So we've got carbon atoms in dead organisms fed back into the atmosphere, and then it can be recycled again. Now, it's not just animals which die, of course. Plants die, they will die and rot down. Also, a big tree like this, this looks like a deciduous tree to me, will drop its leaves, it'll drop its leaves in autumn time, and those leaves will fall to the ground. These leaves will fall to the ground, down they go, and they too will rot down. They will be consumed by decomposers. And those decomposers will release carbon dioxide in respiration, and then that CO2 will go back again to, well, the same plant, or maybe a different plant, but it will be recycled in that way. One other thing to think about here is this little subtext here, fossilization under suitable conditions. Let's say uh, this tree that we've got in the picture falls down uh, and then is covered by other trees and is covered under water maybe and there's not enough oxygen there for it to be decomposed properly. If that happens and then it's buried under tons and tons of rocks over millions upon millions of years, 
then it will become partially decomposed and in essence fossilized trees when they become fossilized after a large amount of time become coal animals particularly sea creatures uh, when they are fossilized in this way become oil and so these this is the basis of our fossil fuels uh, we get coal oil methane peat and these fossil fuels can then be used by us as an energy source and this house is burning fossil fuels maybe it's got a uh, few, few bits of coal on the fire and that's going to release carbon dioxide up this way or maybe they're cooking something on a gas hob and that's going to burn methane and that will release carbon dioxide this way of course power stations will do this and will feed electricity into the homes and those power stations will release CO2 and so even though the home isn't using gas directly to uh, as a fuel source it may well be using electricity produced by a gas fueled power station now this is an overall summary of the whole process uh, again shamelessly stolen from the internet uh, do have a look at all these processes here so your carbon stored in vegetation this would count as a reservoir of carbon there's lots of carbon in vegetation then as the plants die they add to the reservoir of carbon in the soil fossilization may produce fossil fuels um, which would be a reservoir of carbon atoms held underground then as they are burnt that puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere which is going to be a reservoir of CO2 re reservoir of carbon atoms in the atmosphere and as you can see things are cycled around so do have a look at that one in a bit more detail you can just pause the video at this point and have a look at it now going on to our tutorial questions go back and have another listen to this video and then see if you can answer these tutorial questions write them down on a piece of paper and then go back and watch the video again and check your answers thank you